Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and I haven't got much to say on this one, like not my intro bit anyway, aside from, uh, yeah, a long time no see. I hope everybody's been doing okay while I've been away from here, and I could go into about an hour long tangent explaining why I've been away and what's wrong and what's still fucking wrong, but I'm not going to do that, I'm just going to get to the point. Uh, a while ago I did a live stream, it was a few months ago now, of a uh, rebuild of my trash little 486, that one I always called the hooker. And yeah, well, it, that kind of went wrong because it didn't work. Uh, it was the graphics cards it turned out. But we've got it working and this video is going to be a look at what happened you know, to that, what it became, what the rebuild turned it into. It's a nice easy one so I can get back into editing, so I'm out of practice. I haven't really been able to do video editing for a long time now. Uh, so yeah, that, that's that's going to be what this is. Maybe go over something else quickly at the end. And I've linked to the live stream in the description, but it's like two hours long, so you probably want to skip it. Because we'll pretty much say what was relevant in that throughout this video. And as a last note, if there's... A comment, you've asked me a question, I haven't answered it. Uh, I have had a hard time keeping up with them. It's not that I've been getting a lot, I've just had other shit going on and it disappears. It doesn't, you know, once I've clicked to the thing, oh, I'll read that, I'll reply to that in a little while and then I forget and of course the little red one's gone and it doesn't come up when I click the bell anymore. So by all means ask it again in, the, in this video and I will try and get back to you. You know, just drop a comment there. Uh, I'll, I'll try and answer it if I can. Uh, otherwise, yeah, let's get on with this fucking thing. Not much to say. It's a two minute long fucking intro. Stupid. I lied to you. I feel horrible now. I apologise. Yes, well now we've got rid of that inefficient lying moron. What? Who the hell does this voice alpha guy think he is? Hey, I know you're in there, buddy. I'm gonna fuck you up. Oh, right. Not only is he inefficient and dishonest, but he also has an attitude problem and short temper. Brilliant. From the outside, the machine looks much the same as it did before, at least on the front. Granted, I have fixed a few of the screws that hold the front panel and switches in place, but you can't see that. Probably means I did a good job there, I suppose, given that that's kind of the purpose of the front panel, is to cover everything up that's behind it, right? At the back, things are a bit different though. I mean, sure, we still have the same PSU and unused headers here, but we move down a little bit and you'll spot the Sound Blaster Pro 2 that's actually out of the DX4100, which I'll probably briefly explain at the end of this video. But for now, I'll go as far as to say it broke down catastrophically, and as it was far from the first time the CPU and motherboard had shat themselves in that one, I decided to give up on it. Thus, the card ended up in here, as I thought this machine would probably make better use of it. We already know what it does anyway, so we're not going to go into much detail on that card. And below it's a 3Com3C509 Ethernet card, it's 10 megabits per second. This is the one that came out with the Leo Databook, if you remember. It had a working onboard Ethernet controller in there, leading me to think the bank probably installed this one just for its BNC connector or its boot ROM, which it does have installed. And yep, you heard me right, bank. You know, it makes me wonder whether I should have imaged that hard drive or not. Maybe I should get rid of the image I took. Then the same old host adapter card is found below. As before, it's just what it was. And then there's a graphics card beneath that. The old QuickWorks 24i went to the 386, or should that be 486 DLC 40? Yeah, I gave that a faster CPU, it's Texas Instruments branded one. Uh, still want to upgrade to at least 12 megs of RAM in there, though. I want to make it run quick. It'll run horribly, I know, I just want it to actually run it. The card might be a bit overkill in that machine, but everything else I have is PCI, so it's no use to them. And I'd rather have too good of a graphics card in a machine than one that's going to bottleneck like the Trident that was in there before. Trident sucks. Anyway, it's time to look inside the 486 here, the uh, 486 SX, not the 486 DLC. And yeah, we'll have a look at that graphics card, this new one. It's an STB Lightspeed, 2 megabytes. It uses Visa Local Bus as opposed to ISA, and it sports a Seng ET4000W32P, a special version of the ET4000 designed for PCI and VLB interfaces. In short, it's like the ISA one we had, but it's on steroids. Interestingly, if you have 2MB of RAM with this chip, it interleaves the memory. 
And I was going to explain this to you, but I figured the internet would do a good job of it. So I'm going to go so far as to say it's a bit like Raid O for memory chips. I'll include a link to Wikipedia in the description. I'm sure that'll explain it for you. As another point of interest, there is an internal RAM DAX on the Seng graphics chip. So the ones you do get on the card vary in quality. And luckily this STB seems to be using a pretty good one. It's socketed too, so if it ever fails, I should be able to replace it, providing I can find another one. I've never heard of one dying though, so that shouldn't be a problem. It's, you know, I've just got to think of the future just in case. You may remember that the card wasn't working in the stream, or at least the machine wasn't, and the card was pretty much the reason for that, as well as some shitty BIOS settings. That seems to have been a loose SMD chip, and I heated the card up for a while, the problem went away. The host adapter might be faulty, I will have to look out for a new one when I get some more money. Right now I just threw my cash at a new synthesizer and getting the bike back on the road. And I could probably afford one, but it's not really high on the list of priorities. And in this economy you don't really need to splash money out when it's not completely necessary. I'll wait for this one to fail a bit more. It's a VLB controller if you didn't know, and it uses a UMC branded chip for most of the interfaces, except the hard drive interface, IDE, which uses a Promise chip, which were known for being decent, uh, if not fairly good actually. It appears the hard drive is actually the bottleneck on this thing now, and it's more than fast enough for what the machine's doing. The Ethernet card's boring, so we're not really going to go into it. That's that, basically. It's a card that does Ethernet on an ISA slot, and it does it as well as it needs to. It's nothing remarkable, and it's a common model. And I think I've said before that using common as muck Ethernet cards is generally a good thing on an older machine, because they're quite a pain to set up sometimes. This one's not. This one's actually quite easy to make work. We also know what the sound card does, as we've seen it around before. And we won't be playing MP3s on it anymore because the CPU doesn't have an FPU. Although I did discover it has an L1 cache of 1 kilobytes inside it. Uh, it's not much, but it probably does add a bit of boost to the performance. That CPU is a UMC U5S Super 40, like this one. A 40 MHz SX class processor, but provided we only do integer, the machine will catch up to a 66 MHz DX class system using Intel or AMD part. Though I'm unsure of how it compares to Cyrix's products at this time. Speaking of which, I tried using it with this Cyrix 487 add-on here. Seen with another Super 40 hanging around there, you'll see how it goes into the board. But it doesn't work. It also doesn't not work as such, as the machine does start, but it won't detect the FPU, and it stands to reason that it's probably not compatible with the motherboard and the processor and... It wasn't that expensive, and I figured it was worth a try, and it's quite a neat piece of kit. You don't see these around, and so I thought I'd show you the FPU, just for the sake of, you know, I don't know how many people have seen these before. It was a really strange idea, certainly no other company I know I've tried to implement anything like that, but it was almost certainly designed exclusively for Cyrix's 486S. Now, who wants to sell me a DX class UMC processor like the U5D so I don't have to do this sort of stuff? The motherboard is an Aquarius Systems Inc. MB4DUVC. But high treason, I hear you say. That looks an awful lot like the JK042 here you had before. And you'd be right. In fact, it's pretty much the same motherboard to all intents and purposes, except it has two more 72-pin RAM slots, as opposed to the four SIM slots, which you can still see the solder pads for. There were versions of this motherboard available with differing RAM slot configurations. This one also has a better Volt reg setup, and support for the Cyrix 586 that I haven't tested as apparently I need to mod the board according to the manual. Luckily, they seem to have made that resistor pack socketed, so I could just pull it out and put a different one in. But I can think of better things to do with my time, and I'm happy with the processor that's in there now. Of course, it would also mean I have to use the bias that came with the motherboard, as I'm using the bias from the old motherboard. It has better adjustments for timings, devices, and D-Turbo but it should be more than possible to hack those options into the Aquarius BIOS when I get round to it, and then burn the hacked BIOS to a new ROM chip, preserving both the original BIOSes in case we ever need them, and for historical purposes as well. 
The REM is kind of funny with this board, it's probably broken. This board only detects half of whatever amount you'll put in there. One thing I was going to miss from the old board was how quirky it was, so I'm almost glad it has a harmless one like this, and I really don't mind wasting half the REM. Thanks to companies like Korg and Roland using it in synthesizer equipment still, you can actually get it pretty cheap, and it's usually better quality than the old stuff that you'll find in old computers. So, yeah. There's a little trick for you. Some people do put a high price tag on it though. You don't want the actual proper branded stuff from those companies. In the upper corner, 256 kilobytes of level 2 cache is installed and you won't be able to see it too well. I really can't get the camera in there. It's 15 nanoseconds, pretty average. Interestingly, this board is faster with all 256 enabled, whereas the old one seemed to run better with one bank disabled. The old board did have faulty logic, however, and it used to differ in real wild performance, so it's a little bit strange there. This new one's generally a better built motherboard though, and I suspect this design was just a reference design nobody altered very much. It'll be a bit like Nvidia based graphics cards today, often use Nvidia's design with few if any alterations regardless of whose name on them. This motherboard has mostly socketed chips on it, and this will make it easier to fix if it ever goes wrong. Looking at the old board, I'm very impressed that it made it a decade further from when I pulled it out of a trash can. I mean, it smells rotten, it looks awful. Don't you believe me? Well, check that out. This is what happens when barrel batteries leak. I did keep cleaning it early on in the time I had the machine, but I think some of the fluid probably got between layers of the board and between components where I just couldn't get it out of there. It had always come out of the traces and solder pads again, so it had obviously gotten well into the workings of the thing. If I can get it on the camera, you'll see that very little's left of many of the traces in the board, explaining why only two slots worked at the end. It's even on the CPU socket there, and that's also burnt, so yeah, this thing really wasn't enjoying itself. I still don't know who built that board, but it's a resilient motherfucker. I mean, it does still start up. You could still use it a bit. And I salute it and its Taiwanese manufacturer. That was a surprisingly good board. Let's not forget that it did render DVDs on a 33 MHz processor. And some of what I did with it contributed to me getting into college or getting a few certificates when I was younger. I hated it back then. But there's a lot of history between me and this motherboard, and it never stood a chance of being the top of the line of machine when it was built with trash, did it? I kind of miss this board and the old knackered up hardware that was attached to it sometimes. I'd like to point out that the old motherboard had some fight left in it before I retired it anyway. Some time back I promised it I would break the 300 points barrier, because we got pretty damn close. Uh, this is in top bench, by the way. Well, probably wondering, did I break it? Yeah, it fucking destroyed it. With the aid of an X5 processor from AMD, running at 160 megahertz with some wacky bus devices and timings and pretty much nothing in the way of weight states, that little trash machine was briefly one of the fastest 486 era machines on this planet. It played Quake, and I mean it played it. I wish I'd been able to capture that, but all I have is the benchmark here. I don't give a fuck about that Vergon's guy that has the world's fastest 486, but conveniently never seems to have posted a single benchmark, as far as I can tell. You had high performance gear, and what the hell did that cost you? Probably a lot. Even if you do a benchmark and it does go faster than mine, it's all a victory when you consider how close this thing probably got. Oh, and fuck the Pentium and K5 too, this thing killed them. In a benchmarking sense at least, those machines are alive and well in reality. A quick note about the battery. That used to live under the CD-ROM drive, and it was hardwired to the motherboard. Remember, I had pretty much no tools and certainly no internet back then to look up pinouts. But now it lives at the bottom of the case here, and it uses the external battery header like a proper battery pack and not like some bodge job done by a teenage boy. The advantages here are that it is easier to disconnect the CMOS battery and it's also safer if the battery ever leaks, as it is at the bottom of the case there. So provided the case is stored the correct way up, a leaking battery will only make a mess of the bottom of the case and maybe the system speaker, leaving all the important stuff above it safe. Probably won't smell too good though, but this thing stinks as it is, so I really don't care. 
So what does it do when you actually start using it? Well, it runs a lot more stably now, that's for certain. Towards the end, the old board was becoming a little bit unstable until it warmed up, and knocking the side of the case caused it to crash again, probably due to the bad traces that it had. Also, the original hard drive pretty much failed. Uh, pretty much died the moment I removed it from the case. And it was good going for something that was bought for a few Richmond menthols, given that it lasted a decade and it was in a pretty crappy state when I got it. The board would throw up floppy and hard drive failure messages often, memory controller error messages and all kinds of things like that once you start it up. Obviously all gone with this new motherboard. Uh, it does run Crystal Dream 2 quite nice as well, even the chessboard bit. I thought it would slowed down horribly there. also run Contrast, which uh, does run surprisingly well for what it is. For the most part, as you'll see here, it is running reasonably smooth, given that it is an SX class 486 at 40 megahertz, but it does slow down a little bit in places, and that's to be expected. This demo is quite a bit newer than the machine, and I think it was probably written for a Pentium, this one, to be honest. It's a good judge of performance, though. It shows kind of how far the thing will go. A lot of demos were built for the ET4000, as it turns out, certainly from Crystal Dream 2's time, as it was probably the best documented card at the time, and its speed would have made it popular with the seekers. The DOS games run absolutely brilliantly on this thing, and the image quality is sharper on this card than it was on the old one. Performance seems more even overall too, probably owing to how busted up some of the logic was on the old board. I mean, cache misses and stuff used to happen on that at complete random, and it did cause little spikes in the performance. It also runs things like Doom quite well. 66 megahertz are required for Doom. No. Hang on, you know what Duke 3D was? Yeah, and it runs that too. It's slowing down a bit by that point, but it's north of 10 frames per second most of the time, which I think's playable. It's not what the machine's really meant to do, it's not why I've got it. I'm just doing what I did with the Pentium 60 and using it as a test of performance more than anything. Unlike the Pentium 60, the performance on this system is pretty even throughout. I can actually get more performance out of this if I tamper with the audio settings or turn the detail down. I'm running this on maximum detail with quite a few sounds being mixed, so it's going to slow it down. It's a sound blaster and the CPU has to do all the work. The benchmarking magic isn't over. Phil's benchmarking list here has another U5 user on it. Here's the U5 SX40, just like this one that I have, which yields identical performance to the U5S in my motherboard. Attack mode is now on. By 0 0.03 of a frame per second, I've edged ahead of him. Actually, a bit better, as I have since tweaked a bit more of my machine, but I've yet to update my entry in that database. I'll fill the bias settings box in as well while I'm there, I promise. Keep in mind that the other guy has a Biostar 8433UUD, which is regarded as a good motherboard, with a UMC 8886 PCI chipset and a Trio 64V Plus. 
stuck in there, in that PCI slot. Yeah, this guy just lost to my UM8498F VLB system. What a loser. Yeah, if you're watching this dude, I'm just messing with you, whoever submitted that result. I'm sorry, I can't remember your name off the top of my head. Uh, I wouldn't have gotten this thing running so well if I hadn't gone in and tried to beat you by tweaking every setting I could. And it's all in good fun. By all means, come straight back at me. Uh, one little thing, though, dude, I would seriously throw that Biostar out. Biostar is shit. Especially that model. I couldn't get Windows Chicago Build 83 to network anymore, so I went to Build 189. Seems to be the first of the leaked builds to call itself Windows 95, and it has a start menu closer to what you should know. Unless you're not as old as I am, in which case, actually I'm quite surprised you'd even be here, but you might not know what the start menu is. Well, basically it kind of did what the start screen does, only it didn't take up the whole screen until you filled it up. On the downside, if you did fill it up, it got very, very messy and it was difficult to manage, so the start screen has some advantages over it. Pick your poison, they're both shit to me. I didn't mind the one in the earlier bills where there were three menus with names like System, Task and Help. That was a decent concept, but uh, probably would have confused some people. By this point, the OS isn't far off of Windows 95 uh, in how it looks and feels, but it is missing a few things. A few function calls and a few APIs aren't there or they just don't work yet. And at this point, it really only exists to me as a means to manage files and use the network and a bit of a novelty. The multi-threaded demo is nice, though. Mm, 16 threads, well, that's pretty good going, actually. I could probably get more out of it, but I just can't be bothered. Yeah, no MP3 players due to no FPU. Hey, but I can play WAV files over the network. How does that do you? Yeah, I best stop that before somebody pulls me up for copyright infringement, hadn't I? So there you go, it's nothing eventful, it works, it's stable, and it's everything the machine deserves to be, as it's served me well in its previous guise, and I'm sure it will in this one. It is basically the same machine, it's just what it could have been if it wasn't built from trash. Heck, the new 512MB hard drive is just a slightly faster version of the old one. It has an Apple computer logo on top of it, I wish I could show you that. Is it wrong that I'm kind of getting off on running a Microsoft product on it? Oh, by the way, look at DOS. Do you like that font? Yeah, oh, I quite like it too. Yeah, what about this one? <laughs> uh, yeah, no doubt somebody's going to ask me how to do that, aren't they? Check the description. So there we are. That's, that's that. It's a neat little SX Class 486 system. There's not much to say on it. It uses some less usual parts, you know, like VLB and whatnot, you don't always see that around. A lot of people go for PCI, as it turns out, uh, which I get a bit bored of. So it makes a nice change. And of course that processor, you don't see those every day. So that's about it for that thing. It's, it's a good machine. I'm happy with it. Hopefully this has got me back into editing. And hopefully the machine hasn't made too many artifacts appear in the video, because it's the workstation isn't very good now. Uh, you know, new motherboard and shit, fucking Intel, stupid, errata documents, and I'm fucking going into it. So you can pretty much leave the video here, and I'll thank you for watching. Uh, you know, I hope you've enjoyed it, hope maybe something you heard in here was useful to you, maybe you've got a similar machine or something, or maybe you're trying to build one, I don't know. But, either way, you know, regular shit, you know, you can leave a comment, whatever, and fucking, I'll get back to you if it's a question. Or, uh, yeah, if you want to stick around a couple minutes more, I kind of mentioned that 486-100 that we looked at a long time ago, didn't I? It's broke. Well, that's been fixed as well, and I'm going to take a quick glance in there, because it doesn't warrant a video of its own, so yeah, it's one of those appendix things I sometimes said I'd chuck on the end. And, yeah, we're doing that today. Let's have a look inside the thing, just quickly. It's not going to be too in-depth. Not a lot different. It's mostly the same hardware. Oh, yeah, this thing. Oh, damn it.
It spent most of the time I've had it been broken. A lot of stuff on that motherboard was replaced over the years, including the processor. It only takes AMD's 8T chips and not the 8B chips. In short, write through only. No write back models. Which sucks, as those are what I've always had the most of. Now, they're definitely what I have the most of, as it's killed all of the 8Ts that I had. All but one. Uh, eventually the RAM died out again, followed by the motherboard and CPU again. I only ever kept it going because of its background, but by this point I was kind of tired of it. I mean, it, I can never get the thing to stay working, and it seems to kill other stuff that's in there, and that's bad. That's what the Athlon 64 did that I had years ago, and that fed up. Well, I disagree, because it doesn't matter what motherboard I buy, AMD-based systems always fail within the first couple of weeks. I mean, if it can't handle a few hours of a burning test, that's it. You know it's a shit system, and that's it. This is what happens when the machine doesn't work, and my boot meets it. I'm just making a log of this for no real reason at all. Fucking Fenon piece of shit. Inside, it's sporting most of the same hardware, except the motherboard was swapped for this first international computing one. That's the company that made the Leo. The model of this board is 486 VIP IO. It's an unusual board with a lot of connectors and settings you probably wouldn't ever have to change. You can, for example, fiddle with the keyboard controller and IRQs for onboard components you've never heard of, or the thing that handles the IRQs for everything else. A lot of them I don't even know what the function is, and they sound serious, and I've decided just to not play with them because it seems to work as it is. You do have to do some strange things in the BIOS, though, to make the Ethernet card work. And I can't remember what I did, so I'm, I'm sorry, I can't show you. It's probably worth noting that the, if you put default BIOS settings on, it has a password, too, but I managed to figure out what that is. It does support write-back chips, so I could have put one of those in, but as the Leo's running an AMD, which is identical to an Intel part, rendering either in kind of useless, just run one brand there. The hook is running a UMC processor, so I decided why not have a Cyrix in this one. It's a 100 MHz Cyrix DS4, it's SGS Thompson labelled, a common chip, and it's nothing special. It performs similarly to the AMD, but it edges ahead in a few small areas and falls woefully behind in others. So it's sort of on par with it, but in different places. The motherboard does run at 100 MHz, the processor there, but it only reports 66, and this happens when biases weren't yet aware of faster chips, but it's an internal clock multiplier, so it'll be getting there to 100, it's just the motherboard doesn't know what 100 MHz is yet. There's an updated bias that I'll flash to a chip someday, but it's working as it is, so I'm in no rush to do it. It scores comparably to the old system, and it depends what benchmark you use. As I say, some of them run higher, some of them run considerably lower. It's good at floating point, though. It's possible the fire chipsets having some kind of impact on the performance. I uh, can't really say much about VIA's chipsets for 486, aside from they seem to work reliably. Uh, SIS I don't know about, it's what the old one was. Uh, th that one was never reliable, and I had a DTK motherboard years ago that was DOA, and so I never really found out much about theirs. As it's a reliable machine though, and it seems to be running nicely and stably, it's doing what we want it to do, the Pentium 75 I had is a little bit useless now, yeah, at least in the gaming side of things, because this thing's quite good at that. Uh, nothing wrong with redundancy, I suppose. That machine will either find a use or it'll sit in a corner until I decide to do something else with it. Maybe put a 233 in there, replace that Packard Bell if that thing can't be fixed. I have a spare motherboard for that somewhere. On the last note, this does have an ESS1869 sound card in it. At least I think it does. Uh, you might be seeing a different number on that chip. It's what you're seeing on the chip, not what I just said. It's just an SB Pro clone. It's pretty good at what it does. You can sort of tell it's not a real sound blaster, but it's probably one of the better clones. It's not too intrusive with its drivers either, so... Yeah, cheap, nasty card. Gets a job done. Well, there you go. Now you know what became of that thing. It's working. And, yeah, it uses a Cyrix processor. So we've got a nice variety going now, haven't we? But 
Yeah, there's not much else to say today. Uh, I don't know how regular videos can be from now on, because of course, you know, the workstation's still a bitch to use, and I have to use Windows 7 because of compatibility problems with Intel's shitty RAID controllers, and whatever else fucking problems I can't fucking figure out with the thing. Just Intel were on fucking crack when they released the 8000 series Core 2 and corresponding chipsets on their motherboards. On top of that, I do plan on going outside more this year because I have been sat in here feeling depressed for the past couple of years and I'm a bit tired of it. So, yeah, I kind of want to go outside more this year. Let's not waste the weather, or I'll not waste the weather. Wouldn't want to bore everybody with me just walking around outside. I could do that, I could be on those old the camera in front of me and just walk around like, uh, Yeah, today I just went in the uh, local uh, coffee shop, I got a coffee, and then I had to take a piss. Hey, let's see me taking a piss! Yeah, no, I'm not going to be one of these vloggers, it's stupid. Do they do? They probably do shit like that. Oh no, I don't watch that shit. That's what it looks like from like an outsider point of view. I fucking watch more constructive shit. I've got spare time and I can't go outside. I use it to learn something I don't know yet. Like, oh, I wonder how this works. I'll go and read up on that. Never have looked into how the ISA bus works. Hmm, this is how it works. Uh, incidentally, that went in one side of my head and out the other. It's, <laughs> it's quite complex. But I do have some in-depth documentation on it somewhere. Anyway, I'm High Treason. Thanks for watching. And I should see you again in the future, providing things don't break down horribly again, which now in my look they probably fucking will. Thanks for watching. I might note that having filmed the back of this and now flipped it back over, it's leaving random pieces of sooty muck on my fucking box there. It's the box it lives in. Oh shit, my dressing on that, is it? Yeah.